let me introduce you a little bit. Let me let me uh, kind of bring them up to speed. So I just got done with a video where I released information about the Bimbenic um, case where it's related to some cop picnic naked photos. Um, I also discussed Carmen Botwell's autopsy. And then also we discussed a letter. So this is this is the thing. Um, I knew when I made that video because I've been working with Courtney and Jim and Kim and a whole bunch of other locals for months now. We've all been working together to try to get this figured out to where we can get real change. And I thought it was interesting that one of the comments was, uh, oh, that'll make for a good show when I said Jim was coming on. And I said, this isn't a show. This isn't making a murder. This is real life. And these are real people. So my guest today is Jim Thyrell. And Jim, I'm going to go ahead and spell your name. Correct me if I do it wrong. But that's J-I-M. And Thyrell is T-H-E-Y-E-R-L. And Jim, welcome to the Ducky Show here. Um, so let's let's try to dig in. I mean, I don't even know where you start at this point, but I think it was a couple weeks ago that we had all, you had been talking to Courtney and so forth, and you had explained about this letter. So before we go to that, could you kind of explain to us how you would even come to know of the letter? Did you know Deb Hotch Settler? Well, I I was her boyfriend for uh, five years, and uh, I kind of felt sorry for her. I read her articles in the paper all the time, and I kind of felt sorry for her, and I took her to the races, and we got in contact, and we went together for five years, and I studied the case as much as I could. I went to the DCI. I went to the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. I went to detectives. You get nowhere in this county. It's a corrupt county. So I just kept on, and now we broke up. But uh, she always told me, she says, I got a letter that I never opened. And I said, well, let's open it. So I even offered, I went to the sheriff's department, and I even offered to her to take the letter to the sheriff, and I will get one more witness, and I will be there, and we will open it in front of the sheriff. Well, she denied that. So if there's a letter there, or if she's lying, or who's lying, I really don't know. But I know she told me there was a letter, and that's all I can do. Okay. And I, and I said, uh, I would like the case solved, because I know it's corrupt, please, uh, corrupt people from Manitowoc County involved here. Because I, uh, I had meetings with like five different retired cops. And one retired cop told me the name of a person of interest is Todd Herman, and I'm not I'm not saying that he's the convict, but he is the person of interest, and I got this right from the retired cops, and there, I can't get no investigation going on it from the DCI. Now, did did you also um, go and sit down and have like a three hour meeting with the deputy as well? I had a three hour meeting with uh, Jason Yost by the house at my residence. And uh, we talked about everything. I brought up new information that was supposedly a woman called me from Wapaka where they found the truck uh, buried in an elk farm. And the guy was bragging that he killed Ricky Hochstetler. I took that to him and I said, I don't think you've got to investigate that. I said, just look at your department. I think you'll have it solved. But we spent three hours talking and then Jason Yost looked right at me and he says, Jim, he said, do you trust me? I said, Jason, I never trusted a cop in my life, and I'm not going to start today. And that's where it ended. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> well, you know, I wouldn't have brought the letter up myself if I hadn't already known that you knew this. And it's not only just you that had been told this. So another person, Courtney Skinner, had been told this by Deb herself as well. So it's starting to be to where I'm like, is there a letter? And that's why... I'm I'm trying to say we got your back. Let's just get if there if there is a letter, if there is, can we please open the letter? And I know everybody's mad at me right now because they think I'm putting Deb in danger. Well, all the locals know about this letter that are that, are, that the police even know about the letter. It's not like I'm bursting some bubble. It's just that it hadn't hit online at all. Um so I'm not saying there is a letter. Jim's not. You're not saying there is a letter. We're saying if there is a letter, and that's what I said in the other video, if there really is a letter, 
let's let's d get this open like Jim says in front of witnesses and protect her and and get to the bottom of it because it really would it we've got to start somewhere in getting them to quit harming our innocent people you know when I come out with something I got facts I would not bring out anything false <laughs> I was told about the letter and I brought it out to you, and I said, I got facts that she told me right to my face on it, and then she got mad at me for telling Jason Yost about it. Well, I figured I was going to bring it forward, and she still wouldn't turn the letter over. So if she's got one or not, I really don't know. I've never seen it. All I know is she told me she's got one from Deb Khakis. Right. Now, let's let's kind of move on because there's so much information that I want to cover with you. I actually did ask some of the other um, people that are armchair sleuths what they would like to ask. So I want to get their questions out there, okay? Um, okay. So Sean Mornay says, who do you think did it is his question. Like, what is your opinion of who could have committed the crime? And you don't have to answer, but he would like to ask the question. Well, with all the information I got from the retired cops and everything, and I know them all personally, they were buying a house here with me for hours, and I did this all on my own. I lined up everything. Deb was sitting here. And it's, it all comes back on Todd, Todd Herman as the person of interest and Rob Herman as covering it up, because all he was was a jail lieutenant at the time. Okay. And do you have any opinions on the Avery case of, because I know you know the Averys, like I was listening to, it's kind of interesting because nobody had told me, you had never told me, nobody had told me that you had actually been recorded on one of a couple, I think it was two, jail calls to Stephen. And so I knew your voice, and I was listening to the jail calls, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's Jim talking to Stephen back in 2005, and you're saying, don't sign anything, Stephen. I remember that um, very well. So I find that just amazing to me. I don't, I mean, you have so much history here. Um, but do you have any opinion in that case? What happened? I, I mean, I get that you feel Stephen was framed and he's innocent. We all do. Um, because people that even touch this case, obviously there's enough to say he's innocent. And Brendan, too, is innocent, 100%. But do you feel that you have knowledge of who did it, or what's your opinion? Well, I've been friends with the Avery family since I've been a kid, and I'm 71 years old. And I'll tell you what, I go there all the time. I get along good with the whole family, Dolores, Al. I get along with everybody in the family. And I know Stephen did not do it. I know that for a fact because I seen him work there. I talked to him and everything. And when he went to prison in 2005, I did. Chuck was talking to Steve on the phone. I think it was Chuck or Earl. And I got on there and I told him, I said, don't sign anything. When you sign something, you're, they're going to prosecute you on it. Don't sign any more than you have to. And uh, he listened to me. And then I give him out a whole bunch of paperwork on warrants. All the warrants that they filed at uh, the Avery property were completely 100% illegal. When you do a warrant, you got to have the property that they want on the warrant. If it's not listed, they can't take it. They took a whole bunch of stuff. They took Al's gun, his, his sawed-off shotgun. They took a lot of stuff. Nothing on the warrant. And I showed them all the laws and, well, Jerry Buting and... They never looked at that stuff, but I don't know about now, but it's too late. Did, you, did you ever meet um, Beauty or Strain? I talked to Dean Strain on Debbie's case just for a short time, and I wrote him a letter. Well, I wrote, a, I wrote the letter, Deb signed it and sent it to him, and he didn't reply back because he had so much stuff going on at the time that they didn't have time to investigate. But apparently Dean Strain and Jerry Buting both got information on his case. Yeah, I know that uh, there are, I did find an entire um, FOIA'd, FOIA document list where um, they're trying to get all the court documents, any evidence, anything. So I know you're 100% straight up on that. Now, as my understanding, there came a time when a gentleman came to town named John Farrick. 
Now, did you know him? I know John Farrick real good. We and him traveled for about three months. We went through the Hockstedler case. We went through the Avery case. And I was the one that took uh, John around all over because uh, my uh, my license plate, my, my vehicle was not licensed to me. I had a different license plate on it. So I felt kind of safe because I don't feel safe because all the county employees and all of them know me because I went to county board meetings for years irritating this county and I did a good job at it and so I knew they knew me good so I, I took a car without my license plate registered to me and I, I had John all over the place we investigated we went out to Cleveland Auto we went out all the way to where the vehicle was with parts in the ditch and then we went to Avery's we checked everything we would have Catherine Zeller on the phone with a three-way call guiding us to where she wanted us to go and all that stuff. So, no, I, I know John Ferrick real good. I I think the greatest of them, I'll tell you, he's a good reporter and a smart man. That guy, has got a head on him. It's unreal that he can yeah. remember all the stuff that he does. He is a sharp He is a sharp tack, I'll tell you that. Now, did you ever meet Zellner, or was it just more phone communications? I met uh, Kathleen at, uh, at the salvage yard, I think twice. And she come there with uh, two bodyguards and a chauffeur. And she always sits on the right-hand side of the vehicle in the back seat. And she got out, and I introduced myself to her and talked to her for a bit. And, well, I told her, I said, just keep doing your job. He's innocent. Yep. She said, I would not take the case if he's not innocent. So she said, all I got to do is fight this corrupt system and try to get him released. And I, she said, that's going to try my best. It's going to take time. And you can see it is taking time. So, no, we got a, we got a corrupt system to beat. Well, and you you actually tried to take a stand against that corruption at one time in your life. And what did you do? I mean, you, you, you explained to me how you went about running for sheriff. Well, I, I run for sheriff, and I don't know if you've seen my uh, brochure. I just wanted to clean up the corruption because I've seen so much covered up stuff in my days. Which I brought up, if we checked the records back at the, uh, at the county board meetings, and I got it all on paper because I was in court with it, because I sued the county and I won $85,000, which cost the county over 200000 to fight the case. And the county board member that kicked me out of the county board meetings for life, well, he refused my First Amendment rights, so I took him to court and I beat him. Well, he's still, to this day... A corrupt person is still on the county board, which he should be relieved because he cost the taxpayers over two hundred thousand dollars. Jeez! And, keep him there. and I brought up the porn that Charlie Banky was involved with at the county highway shop, and I got a thirty-seven page document from a deposition that showed that he was watching porn on his computer, and I I reported that to the county board on TV. And that's when I got kicked out for life. They wanted to cover it up, and they did cover it up. Yeah. They, they'd rather they'd rather pay the lawsuit than have it uncovered. And he's retiring, kept collecting a pension to this day. Wow. Um, so a next question from the group was, do you know George Zipper? George Zipper is my neighbor. He's uh, five houses away from me. I know George very well. Me and him get along real good. He acts a little strange. He's got a good head on him. The guy's, I think, 75 years old now, and he works, I'll bet you he works 12 hours a day. Carpenter work. He's got a whole bunch of uh, apartment buildings that he fixes, does everything himself. He's a great man. There's nothing so did you ever, did you life. ever, did you I ever ask, ask him just point blank what he thought about all this suspicion that the uh, people out there, I mean, honestly, it's kind of humorous to me. I've always said this. He's the one guy, the one male in this case that has an airtight alibi by all means from early in the morning till well past 5 p.m. He was seen by his entire crew all day. So he's the one guy with an actual alibi. So what have you ever asked George what he thinks about all the suspicion that has um, kind of buzzed around him in the Teresa Halbach disappearance? I just talked to George, uh, what was it, two weeks ago, I think it was. And I said, are you still involved? No, he says, he says that uh, he was supposedly, they were watching for him that he was transferring a, a body in his vehicle. He said, what a joke, he says. 
So they were actually asking him if he had transported a body in his vehicle? Right. And he said he got accused of that. Right. Good so they God. they were trying to put stuff in his head, too. Yeah. Jeez. Um, so it was interesting. There was a call one time I heard, and they were, like, calling them, he, like, a humane service or something or the county animal hospital or something. And in the background, you can hear... This guy yell out, we found a whole bracelet, a whole entire bracelet. And for years, everybody's wondered if they were at zippers and if the dog ate Teresa. Seriously, that's what the questions were. But my question was, did they ever um, come and, and try to make it look like, or frame zipper anyway, that he caught on to it and stopped him? Or was it just they interviewed him and left? No, I think they made up a lot of stuff on George because... Uh I, I know personally that T was not involved because I said I've known him. I've lived here since 1999. I've been his neighbor, and there's no way that he would pull something like what they're trying to blame him on. You know, it was just a cover-up from the yeah. department. I think that's all it was. Well, yeah, he had an airtight alibi. I said that, like, months ago on a video. Um, he went to work. It was validated. Um, his grandson was in school all day, accounted for every single hour. And so the two of them could not have physically been there to do anything. So um, the next question they have is, and this is a big one um, that a lot of us are actually wondering. So a lot took place um, with the DCI, the fire department, the Calumet ambulance is down all on Cuss Road on the 7th of November, 2005. And so we're all kind of wondering, did the locals know about anything? Did they hear anything about Cuss Road? Um, do you have any recollection of anything about that time frame? With the Avery case, sir? Yeah, time, with the Halbach. With the Halbach disappearance, at that point, they hadn't found any bones. And we had a huge amount of, um, we have photographs and everything of the local law enforcement, DCI, ambulances, um, all kinds of stuff going on right on Cuss Road. And we've also got Michael Bushman logging in on um, his log sheets as what time he's there, what time he leaves, who he's with, all this kind of stuff. He lists out that Dave Siders is right with him. And at the same time, we've got dispatch calls where Bushman, and it's on the 7th, and he's stating that his location is Cuss Road. Well, Dave uh, Siders is the one that found the electronics in the barrel. Um, so the phone of the victim, supposedly, and all these electronics at Avery's, but we're starting to really look at it and go, wait a minute, Dave Siders is down on Cuss Road with Bushman on the 7th, so therefore, when we're listening to the 7th call on November 7th, the dispatch call, they're stating they found electronics and barrels, you know, on Cuss Road. So it's not much of a leap for us to say, well, then didn't they just turn around and plant it right up at Avery's? So what, what do the locals think of all that scenario? Right, but see, me and John rode Cuss Road quite a bit, and one day we were on, I think it's Whitetail Lane or something like that, I forget, it's something with deer anyway. Anyway, we were on that road, because my cousin lives on there, so we were coming out, and Kathleen Zellner called, called John, so we went on a three-way call, and she asked where we were, and we were on that Whitetail Lane or whatever it was, and she said, make a left turn. So I turned left towards the culture sack, going to the pit, by Rodon's pit there, and she said, now stop. And she said, is there a clearing in the cedar trees? I said, yes, there is. She said, is there, is there a clearing? There's logs along, are there logs along the road? I said, yes, there is. I, she said, is there a clearing going through those logs? I said, yes, there is. Well, that's where that shallow grave was where they pulled the dogs off, and that's where they suspect, if she, if she is dead, that's where they suspect something could have happened. Well, and the thing is, is the cadaver dogs were given the sole of her shoe. So they're trained to find this dead human. That's the issue with the, you know, I run the merit every day. Is she alive or is she dead? I honestly, I'm telling you now, I doubt that it's her, 
I think they gave the scent of Carmen Botwell. But that's just me, you guys, my humble opinion. I'm going to keep putting it out there. And I'm going to keep working to um, get the light on what I think. Because I think that's you can't have two girls disappear same day. And both um, are reported missing and dead on the same day, three days later. I mean, it just it's they're the same height, same weight. Y'all know the spill. Okay, let's let's talk about this. So, the Bembenic photos of the picnic, okay? So, when did you first, did you know anything about the, Bem, the Bembenic case at all prior to learning of the photos? Uh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I've seen those pictures and whatever Courtney told me, that's all I know. So, I don't have no first-hand knowledge on any of that. Right, right. Do, have you looked at the pictures good? Do you have any opinion of your own? Um, and I know it's just your opinion, and it's speculation, and that's what we do on my channel. A lot of people don't like to speculate, but I think it's very healthy. So what are your speculations? Have you seen anybody that you're like, well, maybe that could be that person? Well, I am 100% sure, not 99, 100% sure. The lady with the bushy hair is Judy Dvorak, because I know her real good, and I know Dave Dvorak real good, and that one is Dave Dvorak. The Dvoraks are 100% in that picture. That's that's quite... Uh, would you... I mean, I'm just going to ask you, if, if it came down to court, to where we were going to be able to help Stephen, would you be willing to um, work with Zellner and possibly do an affidavit to that, that it's your eyewitness? Yeah. You got that right. I'd be right for him to stand up because, boy, she, what she did to people around here, uh, I wouldn't be afraid to testify with her or Dave. Either one I would take down. All right. Well, sir, hats off to you because that's what we're looking for. And that's why I say this isn't a show. This is real. we got to get these guys out. And, you know, some people say, well, this is entertaining. This isn't entertainment to us. We live right here. And um, I'm going to take a minute. Here, Jim, just to kind of hit something real quick. Um, the locals are standing strong, and Kim was told to back off today in a very serious threat, Kim Ducat. And we have the local authorities are working with her on getting her information and recording such, and it is being taken very seriously. It will not be allowed. It will not be tolerated. We will not accept death threats of any kind. I'm not saying it was a death threat. She was just told to back off. But um, for those listeners out there that want to keep Kim safe and the locals safe, please tweet her name in some way so that everybody knows we're standing by Kim. We're standing up with Kim. We're standing up with Jim. We're standing up with Courtney. We're standing up with the locals. We're standing up with you, Deb Hodge Settler, because we do care. We care for you. We care for all of you. And I got accused of a lot of stuff like lying about this letter and all this. I'm not going to defend myself because I'm going to stay focused on the case. Those that want to go sling mud, do what they got to do, and play drama are not helping us. The locals find it appalling. You guys have been asking the locals to come forward and to speak. Here they are. Don't call them a liar because it's not lies. It's the truth, and the truth isn't pretty. The truth is what really happened, and it gets dirty. It gets messy. There are emotions, but we still have to do victimology. We can't. For years, I went up against, well, I have questions about Teresa. Oh, don't talk about Teresa. Oh, my God, she's an angel. Guess what? She was a normal human being, right? And we learned a lot. And we've gotten a lot further because there are those of us that are willing to ask those hard questions. So bear with me. Have faith in me that I would not have went forward asking those questions if I had not gotten it from serious, serious, accountable people. So I just want to clear the air on that. So now we've got a few more minutes here, Jim. I appreciate you for being so patient with me. Um... How do you feel that as we move forward, you'd like to come back and we get into some of the stuff of, like, historically, I, I mean, you knew everybody. You are in your mid-70s, and you grew up in the area, and I'm sure that you've had moments, like you told me once, about meeting someone at a garage sale and questioning you about your run on sheriff. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I seen uh, Tom Kasurik at uh, 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 
God sale at uh, estate sale over at uh, Two Rivers, and that's when I was running for sure. And uh, oh, he, I said, "Hi, Tom." He said, "Hi, Jim. How you doing?" I said, "Good, Tom. How you doing? Good, good." He says, uh, "You didn't do too good running for sure, did you?" I said, "No, I don't think I was crooked enough." And all he said was, uh, "Well, you can't be too far off." And then I seen him at another estate sale, and I handed him a brochure. And when he walked around the house with it, he threw it on the ground. Should have got picked up for littering, you know. But he's got the authority, you know. He wasn't sheriff sure then, but he was, you know, he was retired. But yeah, he threw the brochure on the ground, so I, I must have been made him kind of disgusted. Wow, you know, um, that's that's kind of interesting to me that when you ran for sheriff, you were basically shut down. It reminds me of, like, Deb Kakash trying to get in to do her job on the Avery property and being barred and threatened to be arrested. And she said she was scared to work at night for fear of her life, but she was shut right down. And that's kind of how it happened with you. You actually came out and said that your goal was to clean up the corruption and actually uncover some of this backlog of how they work stuff in the county, right? Well, sure, but see, the only reason I backed down was uh, I got called into the courthouse uh, three times. Uh, well, I never run for any elected, I never was an elected official running for elected official, but I run the first time like that, and I made my brochure up, which I thought was pretty good, bringing out the stuff, and I didn't have on there uh, paid for buy. So, I made some stickers up, and I put on her paid for by JPT. So I got called into the county clerk's office, which they were really nice to me. I mean, I know them all there. They were very, very nice. And I said, uh, no one. Oh, she said, who's JPT? I said, well, look at the front of the poster, James Paul Tyro. Well, we'll let that go. So they left that go, and, and then I figured, well, they're looking for something. Because uh, I tried to get on the radio. I talk on open mic a lot on uh, be my be my guest in open mic on the radio and I bring up the corruption in the county. I brought up Depp's case every year on January tenth and I bring up their names, everything, and uh they wouldn't let me on the radio. Here I get the guy that owns the station on the radio and he says, Jim, he says, you can't talk on the radio on open mic or be my guest or anything because you're running for sure. And we can't allow that. There's a federal law that says if you're running, the other opponent must have equal amount of time on the radio. And he wouldn't get on the radio with me to have a discussion because Dan called me up. He said, the only way I'll go on the radio with you is if you write the questions and give them to me first. Yeah. And that's where it ended. So oh, I geez. couldn't pass it off posters. So they were going to try to take me down. Hmm. Yeah, they're shutting you down. Um, all right, well, I know we have a thousand more questions that are going to be coming, and so you um, are very welcome. Oh, my golly, I hope, I hope, I hope you come back. Um, and I really appreciate all the work. I know you're staying with us. I know you're going to be standing up. I know that the rest of us are too. And we've got a lot more locals. We're just going to call them locals because there's a lot of them and it would take me a while to name them. But there's locals that are talking all over. And, um, you know, if we're going to fight corruption, we have to start with our own hometown, really. And we have to we have to take care of it. And I've done that twice in my life. I've got laws changed. I've got, you know, to the point where I've worked with groups of people in my hometown, and we changed laws. And we did it for the betterment of ourselves to protect ourselves. We had to get rid of some bad eggs in the batch at our police department, but we did it from the top down. Um, it was a handful of people in a tiny little town. But now we have... A guy that we've known his whole life, he's genuine, he's respectful, and we cleaned it up. And our kids can play outside, and we don't have to worry no more. I mean, yeah, stranger danger, but we have good cops in this town now. And I couldn't say that a few years ago. Trust me, I couldn't. Um, we've, all, we've all had moments when we're doing this kind of stuff. I got asked if I'm ever scared because of me talking. Well, Jim, are you ever scared for talking? I just want to bring up. I just want to bring up one more thing, Ducky. Absolutely. Uh, Andy Coburn is more of a terrorist than he was a cop. He covered up more stuff in Manitowoc County for people. It was unbelievable. Andy Coburn 
his nephew broke into the gas station in Francis Creek and oh, they all caught him and I went up there I talked to her, Robin Kambalik and I got the names of the two people because they one worked there and Andy Coburn investigated it because it was his nephew. He got him off 100% and he told Robin Kambalik, you got to give these kids a chance, let them smoke their marijuana and have fun. Well, what is that for a cop? And also, Andy Coburn arrested me armed with a firearm as a convicted felon. And I fought it for 11 months in Manitowoc County Court. 11 months I fought it without an attorney. I won. The case was dropped with prejudice. I, I subpoenaed Andy Coburn, and he admitted he never seen me with a gun, but he still wrote up that he, he arrested me armed with a firearm. Oh, he my God. This is, Jim, this is just, this is... This is the information that these people that are digging in need to know. So you've got to come back again. We've got to do this more and get more information. Um, the names that you can produce, your memory is, is so sharp. I just, I find it amazing. And I think that the locals couldn't find a better person to start this off with sharing and getting this all out there. It means the world. It could be that this person, next person, the nurse, next, and pretty soon we get this solved and we get these guys home, right? Right. But I said I could share a lot of information, but I think you do a little short ones like this and that'll be good. Yep, sounds good to me. It has been absolutely a pleasure today. Um, I don't even, do you have any need for any editing at all? Uh, not right now, no. All right, then we're going to let this go as if it's alive. Um, do you want me to send it to you to replay? Okay. All right, I will box it up. Um, do you have an email account or something that I can send it to? Or do you want me to put it online and you go click it and play it? I'll have uh, Courtney send that to you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, do it that way because we're still recording. All right, um, this part is going to be edited out at the end, but now I'm going to go back to the recording so that we can sign off. Are you ready? Now, listen to me. All the people that watch my videos online, we have a saying. So I'm going to tell you the same, but then I want you to say it with me. We all do it out of tune, out of time. We don't care. It's kind of like this case, very chaotic. So it's if you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, one, two, three. If you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. Are you there? No, I'm here. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I will get this out on the air right away. Um, but yeah. I'm going to wait for your, your you know thumbs up first, all right? Sure, okay. Thank you very much, Ducky. I'll be talking to you soon, love. Bye. Okay, goodbye.